Tierra. <laughs> Is that the right word for them? I'm going to have to use them in a minute. Y'all behave. Welcome. I'd like to welcome our friends from Hearts of Mercy that are visiting with us today. Welcome. And uh, they're helping with our big event next Saturday. And uh, the proceeds, whatever few dollars we can make, will we'll go to benefit them. Uh, one of our local mission groups that we serve. All right. Everyone ready then? Let's calm our hearts and prepare our minds for the Scripture. We'll be looking at uh, primarily Romans 2, 1 through 11, and then a little bit of Romans 1, 28 through 32. And um, our study, we come to this point, like last week, we come to a very difficult passage of Scripture. And uh, it was one of those things where you think, well, you know what, I, I just, I don't know when I would pick to preach on the subject that I had last week, the same thing for this week and next week. And I'm speaking on the subject of the judgment of God. And uh, I chose the most threatening looking visual slide that I could find. Uh, and I think uh, not to celebrate it, but to just uh, recognize that we're dealing with, with a true and real reality. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said that there are two, two things in life that are certain. And uh, the first is death, and the second is... Right? And I say that he's half right. I know that the first thing that is certain in life is death. But I would say that according to the Bible, the second thing that is certain in life is judgment. So, what is certain for a human born under the sun? What is certain for us is death and judgment. And with that in mind, don't you think it's very crucial that the local church pay attention to what the Bible teaches about judgment? Why do we avoid hard topics? I'll tell you why we avoid them. Because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody and lose an attendee or an offering. And I promise you this, as long as the church keeps going about things that way, they will never have the power of the Holy Spirit and anointing of God. They won't. And now, this is no permission to be mean or harsh. or, or there, there's, there's no reason to yell and make a spectacle of things. But we must not avoid the clear revelation of the Scripture. If we do, we dishonor our Lord and we prevent our ability to accomplish His mission on the earth. And I hope you can respect and understand that. He said, well, this subject doesn't bother me because I'm safe in Jesus. I won't have the judgment of hell. Well, I appreciate that, and I feel that way too. But you know what? Maybe last week's sermon bothered you, or next week's sermon will bother you. And we as a people, don't we basically just have to say, what does the Bible teach? Lord, help my unbelief. Help us to do it now, Jesus. Because that's what we need. If the subject at hand doesn't cause you st stress or, or conflict, then the next one will. And herein is lordship, the whole concept of it. That we say, okay, God, your will be done and not mine. Teach me and help me in my unbelief to obey and love you. This is what we must do. Okay, with all that in mind... Um, Let's begin to think about the judgment of God. In fact, um, as I was uh, considering the subject, I decided, and as I look at the next passage in Romans, we're going to have two weeks of it. So if you don't get enough uh, uh, condemnation and judgment this week, you can come back and get some more next week. Everybody ready? Let's pray. Help us, Jesus, open our minds. Calm our spirits. Let us conform our will to your will. Let us not be pressed into this world's mold. How that culture tells us that everything revolves around our individual identities and desires. But help us to know that we have an accountability to you, our almighty, wonderful creator, God. Burn this in our minds 
so that it might change us eternally. For good to ourselves, others, and in obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of passages of Scripture for you. First, uh, Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Uh, I said there are two things certain in the world, death and judgment. The Bible says you have an appointment ahead of you, and that is death. You're going to die. Everyone who lives is going to die, and then after that, the judgment, the, the second certainty. Apart from culture, where everyone stands and says, not me, I will not be held accountable, and I will not submit myself to the rules of man, civil society, or God, you will face judgment. I don't celebrate that. You're in a heck of a spot. If you live your life thinking that you're under the authority of no one, no, no, no culture, no government, or no God, I feel very sorry for you. Because inevitably, you are going to face the judgment. It's as if you're going to be swept away in a moment, beyond your capacity to resist, into a world that is so foreign to you. You've never even considered what you're about to see and experience at the judgment. Have you ever had a moment in your life where something happened that you were absolutely helpless to prevent it. I remember, it was about 1998, uh, Allison was born, she was about a year old, and Dina and I were traveling to visit uh, family members, and we were in uh, automobiles, it was cold, it was Christmas time, but very cold, and there were, there were, it was icy everywhere. The roads looked clear, and so we're traveling at a reasonable speed around country roads, and I hit a patch of black ice. And when I, Allison's in the car seat in the back, Dina's passenger seat, I'm driving. And the car felt to me when I was driving that it, that it lifted up and spun around. It felt like more than once in the road. It was just, and while I was driving it, I thought, there's no control of this. My hands, I, I mean, I just took my hands off the wheel. The car was spinning and I could not control it. By miraculous intervention, I think angelic assistance, my car was righted in the road, set right in the lane, and we continued to our destination. And Dina said, what was that? I said, uh, that was either the strangest anomaly of the universe or an angelic encounter. <laughs> but while experiencing it, I thought, I have no control. I, I really felt I have no control over that moment. I told you a few weeks ago when I jumped out of an airplane and my chute was tangled and I couldn't straighten it and I nearly died. And when I'm free falling, uh, trying to parachute and I couldn't control it and I thought I was going to die and I felt this is a moment I cannot control. Maybe you've had a moment that uh, <laughs> you couldn't control. Maybe it was when the doctor said to you that you have the, the worst news. You have, a, you have a disease that we don't know how to remedy or, or help. If you've never had a moment where you had no, absolutely no recourse of action that you could control your outcome, then it's going to be hard for you to understand this. But what I'm telling you is, if you've, if you've never had that moment, you will. And that will occur at the judgment of Almighty God. As sure as your death is certain, your standing before Almighty God is certain. And you will look Him in the eye to give an account for everything that you have thought and done. And the things done in the dark will be brought out into the light. And there'll be nothing you can do about it. You say, well, everything in me resists that message. I get it. Everything within your sinful nature resists everything that's proper, true, and scriptural, and right. you got to accept that. That your fleshly nature never wants to obey God. It always wants to run free and, and loose. You always want self-acclaim and glory for yourself. At the, and then to say that God, be gone, be apart, be away from me. I don't want any accountability for God and neither do you. This is human nature. 
And it is appointed unto man once to die. An appointment. I've said before, and do hear me, it's very encouraging. Over the years I've said this a hundred times and been received back with wonderful help from people who said, thank you, listen closely now. There's one appointment to death. There's only one. It's not casual or accidental. It's an appointment that God knows. What are you going through today? Do you think this is it, your appointment with death? It might be. If it is, it will be in the hand of God and in his control. There won't be an accidental appointment with death. It is appointed, already determined, way in advance in the counsels of God, your date when you will see him face to face. And so that means you don't have to worry. You've got something wrong with you. This might be my one. If it's one, if it's my one, I can trust God with the outcome of it. But otherwise, why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why am I concerned? Because there can only be one that is my appointment unto death. All the other ones are just to remind me that I will have one coming to, that I will face to humble my heart. An appointment with death and then the appointment to judgment when we will face him. Okay, with that in mind, let's move forward a bit. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear. How many of you say all? Uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Is there anyone that might escape or uh, uh, suppress or surpass all? No, that's all of us. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ out of your control, apart from whether you've ever believed or not, apart from any cultural message, no matter how loud the voices are in the world that says, be yourself, do what you want, don't worry about any accountability to God or man, no matter what any voice is, there is a voice that is superior to every human voice, and that voice is the voice that created all of human beings and all of creation, who by his very authority through his voice spoke this world into existence. That voice, that voice, that voice overcomes every human voice that is clamoring in your ear to cause you to think, I don't have to be accountable for who I am and what I do. There was a, in 17... 03, a man born. His name was Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, I believe, was the greatest theologian in the late Puritan period. Maybe since the early church fathers, maybe since Augustine. Uh, my opinion, the greatest certainly at the late Puritan period. Jonathan Edwards was the pastor at uh, Northampton Church in uh, Massachusetts. And he preached a sermon at a visiting church in 1741. In 1741, it was about the time when this church was getting started. And uh, so let me show you the picture of this guy. He's, uh, yeah, there you go. So Jonathan Edwards then was preaching a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an, of an Angry God. And this was common. In fact, it was so common for preachers to preach about judgment and wrath and anger of God that the congregation not only accepted it, but expected it. Now today, I dare say, in all of evangelicalism, probably less than 1% of the sermons going out in the hearing of God's people is about anything negative at all and certainly not about judgment and wrath. You disagree? You know what they'll be about? How to have a better marriage. How to raise great kids that love God and love you for a lifetime. How to increase your profit status through multiple streams of income. This is the sermon content of the evangelical church today. And so to say that we're going to say two weeks, we're going to talk about judgment and the judgment seat of Christ 
and what it's going to look like and what it's going to mean. It, it, this is absurd. This is unthought of. It wasn't so throughout church history. It was normal, very normal. He said, well, it makes me uncomfortable. Well, let me ask you this. All of the little tiddly preaching that tells you how to have seven steps to have a better marriage, has it made you a better, is your marriage any better? You know what makes great marriages? Humility brought by the conviction of the Holy Spirit where people are submitted to their creator God and they say, not my will, but your will be done. I'm going to love my wife like Jesus loved the church. And you don't get that without the Bible. How are we going to have raise great children? By saying, here are the steps. You feed your children at a certain time. You do it this way. You do it that way. You don't let them do this. You don't do it like that. How do we raise great children? We teach them that to love God with heart, soul, and mind and your neighbor as yourself is the whole goal of life. And then the child, if he gets it, he has life in himself and he can grow up to be a great human being. I'm not trying to justify preaching hard stuff. I guess I am. I'm just saying how weird it is. It's just weird. It wasn't, used to be weird. And the power of God fell upon the Massachusetts Bay Colonies in 1740 and following. And it was the beginning of what was called the first great awakening in the colonies of America. Jonathan Edwards was one of the leaders in it. And I want you to just read a couple of uh, quotes from that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And just contrast that to what we get in most churches today. Okay, ready for this? He said, The foolish children of men do miserably delude themselves in their own schemes and in their confidence in their own strength and wisdom. <laughs> True enough. They trust to nothing but a shadow. And some more of it then. The wrath of God is like great waters that are damned for the present. They're damned for the present, these great waters, the wrath. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher until an, an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course when once it is let loose. And one more just for your um, Sunday enjoyment. The bow of God's wrath is bent and the arrow made ready on the string. The justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. God could be angry. God is angry with the sinner every day. It is a fearful and terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. You say, well, what kind of God is this? He is an, he is an absolutely authentic God. All of his attributes are at work in his expression in everything he does. Is God loving? Yes. Is God angry with sin? Yes. Does God extend forgiveness? Yes. Does God extend judgment? Yes. All of these are part of his attributes. And you can't discount one attribute, like the, like the anger and justice of God, in order to only saturate yourself in the love of God. So the cultural mindset says, for me, I will pick the, the attributes of God that are comfortable for me that I like. I'll pick those. Can't do that. It would be, <laughs> imagine... What if I started trying to define you and your personal attributes? I'm like, I look at you and I know most of you, a lot of you, I know a lot of you. And I begin to say, well, this person's like this and this person's like that. What if I begin to mischaracterize you? How would you feel? If I said, oh, this person is, is, uh, this person is arrogant, but you're not. Or this person is uh, uh, too quick to speak, but you're not. What if I characterized you improperly? Wouldn't that anger you? But we do it to God all the time. We say, God, you don't have a right to tell people that they're accountable. Even though he made us and created us and gave us the world and gave us our life and sustains us, we say, God, you don't have a right to tell me how to live and what to think. 
we do it to God, but we won't even let other people do it to us. And we shouldn't. And he won't. The arrow is one moment from being made drunk in the judgment of your blood. So this is a message I, I, I can't even believe I'm hearing this. I can't even believe I'm saying this. Oh, I can say, I can believe I'm saying it. Yeah. Hmm. This is the portrayal and the reality of what you will face. As helpless as I was with my car spinning in, on the icy street, this is how it will be when you, are, when you are taken in an instant, unprepared, wagging your fist the whole way, you will face your creator eyeball to eyeball, and you will give an account for the deeds done in the flesh. Does that cause you any concern whatsoever? And you say, well, not really. And you know why it doesn't? Because every voice you have been hearing your whole life is that every man can do what he wants when he wants for whatever purpose he wants with no judgment or accountability for anything that he ever does. This is not the biblical portrayal. Now you could say, well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, you could say that, but you cannot say the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does teach this. Okay? With that in mind, here's where we're going to go, and uh, this we can't do all today. We'll have this in next week. The judgment of God, this is going to be kind of a general study about what's going to happen when we go to that judgment and we face God. What will it be like when we face God? And uh, I think it'll be interesting, or uh, I expect it will be helpful. We're going we're gonna to take the Romans passage and we'll divide it in five sections. The reality of our rebellion against God, deserving judgment, the warning of judging others instead of judging self, the certainty of judgment, the passion or the person who will judge, that's Jesus, and the timing and outcome of the judgment. So that's where we're headed this week and next. Let's begin then with the first point. The judgment of God, the reality of our rebellion against God deserving judgment. <clears throat> we're going to have to back up a little bit into Romans 1, where we were last week, to the uh, last couple of weeks, to get, a, get, get this glimpse, glimpse here of what this is. And so let's then take a look, Romans 1, 28. And since the, they did not see fit, they, that meaning us, since people did not see fit, to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were determined not to obey God. God said, go ahead, have it your way. And your way was the debased mind. Three times in chapter 1, you see that God gave them up. Verses 24, verse 26, 27, and verse 28. God gave them over. He says, okay, you don't want to say my will be done, then have it your way. And so God gave them over. And when God gives you over, it is the removal of the restraining force that's preventing you from expressing the full fleshly nature that you have in the sin and in the fall. You get that? When God turns you over to yourself, it's the removal of the restraint that prevents you from expressing fully just how bad you could be. <clears throat> Verse 29 and they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. When they didn't want God, and God gave them over, what was the manifestation of that, of that action? What happened? They were filled with manner, all manner of uh, unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. This is what it looks like when God turns you over and you do what you, what you fully want to do. Now verse 32, and this is simply the question. The reality of our rebellion against God. What are we like? We don't want God, and so in place of God, He lets us have what we want, which is the expression of our fleshly nature. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree... That those who practice such things, what? Deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. 
Not only do they not want to believe it, but they're giving approval to people who are also suppressing the truth and getting turned over to God. It's like they stand back and there's a stadium of voices in culture today that says, be as bad as you want, reject God all you want, you are an island unto yourself, your beliefs are the only beliefs that matter. And not only do you take that privilege and indulgence for yourself, but you applaud other people doing the same. While they march to their destruction, you encourage their demise. And you're watching them go to judgment, and you're with them or behind them or in front of them, and you'll both stand in judgment before Almighty God and give an account to the Creator. So that was the first thing. Secondly, the warning of judging others instead of judging yourself. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now remember, those of you that are new today, I'm just going verse by verse through Romans, but I've got to ha kind of have a whole view of what the Bible's teaching as we go so it makes sense. So now we're at chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. And I'm saying that there's a warning when we're talking about judgment. We don't want to judge ourselves. We want to stand back and, and judge other people and say, okay, not my sin, but your sin is in focus in my mind. And what did Jesus say? Let the one, I mean, you, you want to you get the speck out of your brother's eye, well, then get the log out of your own. In other words, don't attend to anybody else's sin until you've dealt with your own. And by the way, because I can never fully deal with my sin, that would pretty much uh, exclude judgment of me for you. Hello? How am I going to get a speck out of your eye when I can never really get the log out of my own? So that makes me have to stand back and say, I, re I really can't, can't, I can love you, I can encourage you, I can counsel you, but I can't judge you. There's only one judge, and it's not me. It's not you either, by the way. All right, now we're ready for the reading of it. Therefore, you have no excuse. Therefore, puts, looks us back to chapter 1, where it said, you have... Uh, you have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. God has handed you over to the desires of yourself. And the outcome is envy, maliciousness, all of the sin that was listed that we read. Therefore, you have no excuse. Oh, you have no excuse, old man. Every one of you who judges, talking about judging others, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. In other words, when you stand and judge another human being, and you don't even seriously realize that you're just as guilty in your heart or in your action as they are, all you're doing is pronouncing judgment on yourself. Because you have no control to judge the other person. You don't, you've not been given that, that job description. That's above your pay grade. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Rightly falls, see that? Do you suppose, old man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet you do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You stand around with your eyes and your finger pointed in the direction of other people who do things that you yourself are doing at the same time. Therefore, the judgment is falling upon you because you're categorizing sin that you're guilty of, and yet you have no concept of it in your own life. You have a log in your eye, and you're trying to remove the speck from someone else. And do you think you can ignore or escape the judgment of God? Verse 3. Verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? What, what is that verse? What are they talking about there? Uh, you presume on the riches of the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that kindness is meant for something, your repentance. So imagine what this is now. you got some kind of spiritual knowledge. You've been in church long enough. You, you feel like you know what's right and wrong. You see somebody else doing something you, they shouldn't do or you think they shouldn't do. You need to pass judgment on them. Now, the scripture right there said, if you pass judgment on someone else and you're guilty of it in the same way, all you're doing is bringing to the reality 
that you're the one guilty also, but you've got no power to judge them. All you've done is brought the spotlight of judgment onto yourself through the judgment that you passed on them. You see what I mean? And then he says, and what of this forbearance and patience that God gives to give you the credit, to give you this situation where you think you have the right to judge someone? It's like God's given you the knowledge that you have and the graces that you have, and you think, okay, now I have it. I have this knowledge. I know what's right and wrong. And don't you know that it was the grace of God that gave it to you? And don't you know it's his forbearance and waiting because you're going to face judgment too. But you think, okay, I know, and therefore I have a right to judge you. And God says, I've given you this forbearance and grace and the knowledge that you have for a purpose. And that is uh, meant to lead you to repentance. Leading you to repentance means that the faith journey we're on is not about an ascent, an acknowledgement of the mind, but it is about a truth reality of the heart that changes everything. This is called being born again. One of the great problems in church life in the last many years is that we tell people that the way to God is to make a, a profession, a, a, a statement in your mind and say, I believe Jesus died for me. Yeah, but faith without works is dead. If you have no reality to what you're saying to yourself, you don't have any substance of what you just said. It makes no sense. If I said the building's on fire, I'm going to exit. If we say that Jesus is the Son of God who calls us to lordship and I don't change the way I live, then I can't truly say I believe that he is Lord. Let's move on. And the, and the last thing of consideration for today, the certainty of judgment. So we've got a, the reality of rebellion. That's us. We've suppressed the truth. We don't want to obey God. We want to live it our way. We want to have it our way. God says, okay, have it your way. The result is worse and worse. And then we stand back and say, in the middle of all doing that, we're going to judge other people and say, oh, you, look at you, you wrong sinner. God says all you're doing is judging yourself even more. The certainty of judgment. And this is the last verses here. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, unrepentant heart is what that means, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Verse 5, everyone listening. I know I've been preaching a long time. Listen close now. Almost done. Read with me aloud, verse 5. Everyone ready? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Who's it talking to? You. Me. This is us. He will render to each one according to his works. What will God do? He will judge according to your works. This is an appointment you will keep. After death, it is followed by the judgment. You will face God, and he will, you will give an account. There will be justice, and you will face it. Beyond your shaking fist or loud voice of resistance, you will be drawn inescapably before Almighty God, and you will face him. And his justice will be right justice. This is scary. It should be scary. So are you trying to scare me? Yeah. The scripture is scary. <clears throat> he will render to each one according to his works. Verse 7. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But... For those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and what? Fury. Fury. God's just not tiffed with you. He's furious. His anger is a, is a rolling fury. And how couldn't he be? Because in his attributes, justice is required. God can't look out and say, I'll just let that one pass. We do that. Because we can live in a world of, uh, of uh, disconnect in our consciousness. We can be dis disconnected. We can believe one way and act another. That's us. We're human. God cannot do that. He's completely consistent. He must judge. He must be just. Purely so. 
And so when you say, well, why is God so angry? We're, we're weak. We do stupid stuff. God is angry because he has no choice, but that's, his, that's who he is. But he's also loving and gracious and gives us a way out. We'll talk about that in just a minute before we quit. Um, verse 9 there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. What's going to happen at the judgment? There will be tribulation and distress for every human who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. I'm talking about a world that we want. Say, I don't want to be judged, but you want this world. You want the world where God expresses his full attributes, all of his love, all of his patience, all of his grace, and yes, all of his justice. We want a world like that. Because the world we're in right now is unjust world. Poor people have no right or ability or standing or they have no chance in the world. How do they get a start? The poorest people in our, in our culture in the world, the people of the Appalachians, the people in the inner cities, the people right down the street. How do they get an up in the world? We want a world that's just. We just don't want a world that's just as it relates to us. We want God to right this present world. We want the world to operate where everyone has an equal chance and everyone can be loved and everyone can be safe and secure. We want a world like that. We just don't want to face judgment ourselves. The same God who is just as it relates to the culture and the world that we pine for is the same God that will hold you accountable for how you live and think and treat other people. Don't say, give me a perfect world when you will not treat your friends and your loved ones and love your neighbor as yourself. You see how hypocritical that is? Listen to me now. How hypocritical that is. We want a just world, but we don't want personally any cost. And then when we say that with, with our expression of unconcern and, un, and unloving living, we're never going to face a judgment for that. See how hypocritical that is? That's why you can't judge someone else. But this is why you're going to face Almighty God. We stand around and say, we want a perfect world. We want it where everybody has everything that they need at all times, safe, secure, and protected, and I want that too. We want a perfect world because we trust a perfect God, a just God, a wonderful God. We want that, but we don't want that same justice applied to us. What I'm saying today and next week is, that same justice that we call for in all of the created culture and all of the creation, that same justice will be applied to you and you will face God and give an account for every idle word, every misdeed, everything done in darkness will be made to light. This is what the Bible teaches. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being that does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good to the Jew and the Greek. For God shows no partiality. No partiality with God. That's what we want. We want God with no partiality. With all that in mind, remember then, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. What, a, what, what do we do of this? I mean, here we are. I mean, right in the middle of this concept of facing God. Let me just say a couple of things, uh, encouraging words. Uh, and before I read the scripture, this sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. One of the most published sermons, maybe the most published sermons in the history of America uh, from 1741, Jonathan Edwards, from the quotes that I read earlier, he also said this. He said that uh, it is as if a great gulf is beneath us and the fires of eternity are boiling in that terrible place. That place where the fire burns forever and is quenched not. And affixed over this terrible gulf is a spider's web. And from one side to the other, clinging tightly to the web, is a single spider. And that spider is me and you. 
And that web is sustained only by the grace of God. But in a moment, God will break the web and the silver cord will break. And to your destruction, without Jesus, you will fall into the lake of fire. God's eternal judgment. Say, I don't believe that. I don't like that. It doesn't matter. This is what's going to happen. I didn't want my car to spin in the road. I didn't want any, I didn't want my parachute not to open. Out of my control, there came a moment out of my control. And that's how it's going to be for us. So Edwards says, there's like a spider web and I'm hanging tightly to it. And God, by his grace, is, is holding both sides. So, so what is our fear of judgment? There is no fear for believers. And why is that? If we believe in the Lord Jesus according to the promises that also gave us the scary part, God also gave us this wonderful part. And look at it. There is, therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. In this terrible scenario where we're, where we're in a precarious position, perched over hell in judgment, uh, that, that God who's certain to judge because of his attributes, he says, there's no judgment for those who are in Jesus. No condemnation. God's forgiven you. And so there you are. You're in this position where you're going to face judgment, but the judgment you face, what's it, what's it going to be like? Jesus took my judgment. If you believe in Jesus, he took your judgment. Not judgment for your works. I'm talking about Jesus took your penalty for your sin so that you don't have to be dropped into judgment, into hell, into the lake of fire. Jesus went into judgment for you. And uh, that's what we call being born again. That's what, that's what we call having a new life in Jesus. That's what we call having a changed life. That's what we call moving beyond religion into reality. To say that when I couldn't help myself, an angel stopped my car and reset it in the lane. In my sin, when I could not save myself, a Savior stood on my, in my place and died for me. This is, this, is, this is the real stuff. This is, what, this is what we're calling for. This is what the church needs to be calling for. In a bold and proclaiming, non, unashamed way, the church needs to announce loudly, you must be born again. And being born again means that Jesus paid it all for us. And then, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. That's Jesus. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's well, see the exchange, don't you? Our sin on Jesus, Jesus' righteousness on us. When we go to the judgment, when we talk about next week, we have judgment for sinners. That's the great white throne judgment. Um, and depending on how we see the timing of things, there's also there's a judgment for believers too, by the way. Not for heaven or hell, but about rewards. And... Uh, uh, I think personally it's one judgment with both people being dealt with, sinners and saints. Other people believe there are two judgments, but we'll talk about that next week. But at this judgment, whether it be in this time frame or that time frame, I'll tell you what's going to happen. When they ask me, what right do you have to go into heaven? I'm going to say, none whatsoever. I was a sinner hanging tightly to a thread, perched over hell itself, and by God's grace, he sustained and kept me and plucked me from sure destruction. Someone said, this spider's web that I cling to in Jesus was spun by the grace of God, unfailingly spun by the grace of God. I call you then, in the reality of Almighty God and his clear truth, that you will face judgment and give an account that you will not be able to answer for, I call you to cling tightly and call out earnestly for Jesus who died in your place. Would you do that today? That's up to you. I can't. You got to do it. When I did it, that's what changed my life. Changed my life. And uh, so may the Holy Spirit help you to see it Let's pray together then. Let's pray. Oh, Almighty God, how wonderful is your grace and your love. And when we think about hard things, 
we, 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 we don't like to hear it. We don't want to talk about it. We, but it does us some good. It does us some good that easy messages can't. It gives us some real meat and milk and strength and vitamins for our spiritual life so that we could say, yes, there's coming a judgment. Everyone's going to be at it. But Jesus took our judgment for us as it relates to heaven or hell. And so with that, we praise you. We must be changed, and we must be humbly appreciative for what you've done for us. Thank you for it. And help everyone listening now as they evaluate themselves to see whether they're in the faith or not, that they be, take this seriously, that they let the Word, the Scripture, uh, impact their thinking, and not just listen to the loud voices of, of, their, uh, of their peer group or social media. Let them think about what you have said in the Word. In Jesus' name, amen.